how to get rich with meme coins without getting lucky. Let's say you have $100 million and you spend $50 million on Bonk and you're wrong. You're fucked. If you spend $2 million bucks and it drops 50%, it's not the end of the world. If it goes up 100x, you just crushed it. <laughs> Joe McCann, founder, CEO, and CIO at Asymmetric. 2023's top performing hedge fund globally. Joe is an early Solana investor. And is most known for his depression or meme coins to $1 trillion thesis. How do I make it in crypto as a new investor? Just start a business. That is actually the best way to learn how to run a business. It's not a class or a course or a textbook. No one's going to teach you from a book how to trade. Trading is, for human beings, very emotional. And the only way to actually understand how to trade is to you had chronic insomnia. What did you learn from going to therapy an entire year to solve a single issue? Chronic insomnia, it can manifest in various ways. Some people have difficulty falling asleep. Other people have difficulty staying asleep. I would try to go to bed and I couldn't fall asleep. And so if the place where you're supposed to be resting is now a place where you're working, your body develops this condition that this bed is not safe for rest. And so what happened to me was, and ever since that, I have gotten some of the best recovery and sleep ever. What previous bad or catastrophic events in your investing, trading, or entrepreneurship career helped you recognize that the FTX collapse was an opportunity and not the end for Solana? Oh man, what a great question. So... <sighs> 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests and the better the conversation. Thank you. This conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized trading platform on Solana and the largest DAO in the world. Three, a scalable layer one blockchain that's fast, secure, and affordable, built by previous Facebook developers, and that delivers the benefits of Web3 with the ease of Web2. And Mental, an Ethereum layer two that built two products I particularly like, FBTC, which enables you to borrow and lend Bitcoin in DeFi, and METH, or METH, one of the largest ETH liquid staking protocols that, by the way, just launched its token called Cook. Sometimes I have to kind of insist people like, oh, no, man, I want to do it online. I'm like, no, this is not another Crypto Bros podcast. No, I, I love it. That's why I'm glad I'm here to do it, man. It's great. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I've done a zillion podcasts and I feel like I get to the point where I'm just repeating myself. You know? that, that's going to be the benchmark today. Do you repeat yourself or not? <laughs> you can't tell me. Maybe, a few things, maybe, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Glad to be here. Let's start with uh, how you got here. <laughs> um, I mean, in this studio, right? I saw you, I filmed it before, so I'll send you the, the footage. Uh, what are some of the advantages of being really good at your craft and being recognized for it? I mean, <laughs> I guess you end up at your studio in a Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I mean, the, the, I was not anticipating um, cruising around Singapore in a Phantom. That was definitely not on my bingo card, but um, the story is kind of, inter kind of interesting. So a uh, gentleman who owns the car uh, and owns, um, you know, like an exotic car import dealership and is an investor, does a lot of different things. Singaporean? Re yeah. He reached out to me, uh, or excuse me, he reached out to Asymmetric months ago. And uh, there was a woman that was working with us um, who ended up leaving the company. Uh, she's the only person that ever left Asymmetric, and it's because she wanted to be a trader again. And we didn't have any trading roles, and no one else has left the company since, uh, which is kind of awesome as a CEO. Like people want to stay here; it's great. But in that process, his the communication between he and her uh, fell apart, and so um, I didn't even know this guy until uh, he reached out um, to the woman that used to work at the, at the company. And I got the, I get the emails now because, you know, I have any of those emails that go to her account, go to my account. And I was like, Hey, like, uh, Boucher doesn't work here anymore, whatever, you know? And he said, uh, he's like, Hey, I'd like to meet up in Singapore. And I was like, man, I'm super busy. I've got like, <laughs> cause it's true. That's the best, actually. I, I, yeah. I was like, I've got like literally like 10 interviews and three conferences and I'm throwing in a party and I'm doing a party with Iggy. And it was just, it was a ton of stuff, right? Formula one, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
he's like, well, I'm really interested about learning about investing in your fund, this and that. And I was like, oh, okay, well, let me see. Like I copied my assistant in and said, hey, can we see about maybe finding some time with this guy? And then uh, he kind of connected with my assistant and they were chatting and he was like, does Joe need a car service while he's in Singapore? And I was, and she's like, well, sure. And he, he's like, um, he can choose between, you know, a Phantom or a Rolls Royce calling in and I have a bunch of other like exotic cars. And I was like, what, <laughs> who is this guy? Like, okay. And, uh, surely enough at like two in the morning, uh, yesterday when I arrived, uh, there was a, you know, a, a Rolls Royce Phantom waiting for me <laughs> and has been cruising me around the city ever since. And actually went to dinner with the guy last night. He's amazing. He's a very, very interesting guy. Um, he and his brother, uh, and I work, you know, my, two of my brothers work with me at Ace Metrics, So that was really cool. We all had a, an amazing dinner last night. And I think there's going to be a lot more that we're going to be doing beyond him just investing in my fund. So I'm actually really looking forward to, to working with this dude. It's very serendipitous moment, you know? So his strategy worked out. He got you, he got you first, right? <laughs> he got me first. That's right. I mean, how do you say no to that? You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, look like, uh, cause we, you know, we have, we, I was just going to use grab like everybody else and, you know, it's formula one week that the roads are going to be gnarly and, mm. Now I'm, I'm sorted as it relates to transportation. <laughs> so it's pretty cool, man. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty nice. You said, who is this guy? Let me ask you the same question. Who are you? Who am I? I'm just your average Joe. You want to know more? I want to know more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, where should we start? Um, so, uh, uh, I was, uh, I was born in California. Um, And I was raised by a single mom who had four boys. Uh, we moved a lot when we were kids, went to, you know, a dozen or so different schools from kindergarten through 12th grade, always kind of like moving for my mother's job to tell, take care of us and the family. Um, my brothers and I are all very kind of creative, I guess you could say. I'm probably the most analytical, mathematical, but we all play instruments. Two of my brothers are apparel designers. One of them's like a musical prodigy. So we were growing up, we were always kind of, mm. even though we grew up kind of from humble beginnings, we had a lot of creative license from our mother to kind of explore things that we were interested in, whether it was academic, music, fashion, you name it. Um, so I think moving a lot also, uh, I mean, I certainly don't recommend moving your kids as much as we moved. <laughs> I think that love, level of destabilization is not healthy, but also it's built a lot of character for myself and my brothers to be very adaptable to almost any environment. And I think that that has served me well as a, not only as a young adult, but also as an adult and a professional in what I'm doing today. What's the reason you moved that much? You told well, me 13 times, right? Yeah. Yeah. So typically, I mean, it was, you know, so in the United States, the system is basically set up where um, if you're a single parent, you know, typically the other parent should be involved in some capacity, certainly from a financial standpoint, they call it child support in the United States. We did not receive any of that. And so my mother, who was a university professor would work, you know, at university, but then also do, you know, odd jobs or other things to generate additional income to kind of support myself and my brothers throughout that process. And in a lot of cases that required moving because it would be in, you know, in either an incremental or kind of a step function improvement in her career that would better suit us as children, as we were growing up. So it really was more an economical thing, uh, less so like, uh, you know, trust me, I don't think, um, if we had to do it over again, we would move that many times out of choice. You said, I don't recommend that level of destabilization, right? Yeah. I had a uh, Kiao Wang, the founder of Alliance Dao on this podcast a couple of weeks ago. And he said that the, there's two trades they're looking at in founders that they top, top notch crypto founders, they want to invest in the first one is, a. Uh, high uh, le level or degree of autism mm -hmm. because it, it makes you think independently. The second one is uh, some sort of childhood trauma because uh, yep. you have a chip on the shoulder. Absolutely the case. Absolutely no doubt about it. Look, I mean, um, <clears throat> so, you know, I study philosophy um, in university, which doesn't get you a job, gets you into law school but I didn't go to law school. It taught me how to think. And one of the things that I studied, I'm a big fan of uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And he has this, he has a lot of kind of fantastic quotes and aphorisms throughout his works. But one of the things that he identifies in there, he says, if, if a man is born without a, a father, he creates one. And I think that resonates with a lot of folks that may have grown up without a father. Um, and it 
a hundred percent creates childhood trauma. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Right. Um, it is unnatural for, um, children to grow up without both parents. Now, in some cases it's tragedy in other cases, it's, you know, choice. Um, but it does create a level of, uh, inner child trauma that has to be addressed, whether it's through therapy, it's through, you know, holotropic breathing, psychedelics, you know, something else, spirituality, et cetera. Um, and in the meantime, you end up with a pretty strong chip, chip on your shoulder. I also am just like fascinated with the world and, and wanting to understand things, um, seeking knowledge in myriad subjects. Because if you look at like my background, it is not like, oh, this guy went to university and got a master's degree in finance and now runs a hedge fund. Like that's absolutely not my path. And it just has to do with the fact that I'm interested in a lot of different things. And I really don't, I don't have a fear of failing or losing at anything. And I think that comes from a lot of the childhood trauma that comes from, you know, creating a father when you don't have one, that father being kind of like the, the part of you that, um, is seeking some level of fulfillment. The reality is, is that it never comes right. And acknowledging that at some point in your life, if you're someone like me is very, very important because it can then help you kind of manage the stress and, frankly, steer you in the direction for things that are actually of interest to you versus like, oh, I need to go to college, be a man. I need to like do these things, check these boxes because that's what I'm assuming is correct. It's nonsense. Once you kind of get past that and you start to pursue what you're actually interested in, like the whole world kind of opens up. Was the moment you realized that that was not it? Oh, um, yeah, it was, it, <laughs> I'm 44. So it was, it wasn't that long ago, believe it or not. <laughs> um, There was a moment when I was running my last company, Node Source, where uh, I hadn't gone through, you know, some some form of like talk therapy, um, where you know I was wondering to myself, like, you know, why am I feeling this way? I just raised a Series B, like the company's doing really well. You know, the open source project is exploding globally, like the, all of these kind of like you know accolades, mm. and I felt nothing from it. And I was like, something's not right. And so this is one of the first time I actually engaged in, in um, psychotherapy. And I, th I absolutely think everybody should do it. You know, I have a personal trainer for my body. I think of a therapist as like a personal trainer for your brain. It's the same thing, in my opinion. And that fundamentally changed my perspective and uh, has served me since then. So it's probably like six years ago. Why should everyone go to therapy? Well, if you're of the belief that you want to take care of your body, Um, you know, a lot of people tend to exercise, they do fasting, they do, you know, certain diets, whatever it is. Um, there isn't a lot of focus on the mind and training the mind. And so having, you know, you can call it a therapist, you could call it a coach. You know, I think a, a lot of folks in the United States, given the regulatory environment for these type of practitioners end up calling themselves coaches. So they don't have to file for some license in every single state. But ultimately, you know, I have a coach that I train with at the gym and I have a coach that I train with for my mind. And I think that if you want to be physically fit, you can, you can certainly do it yourself. There's, there's things you have to do on your own, mm -hmm. but it's, I would argue you always, you know, end up with better results if you have a physical trainer, like, Absolutely. you know, and I think that's exactly the same thing for your brain and your mental health is that you can absolutely try to do it on your own. And I think that there are practices, people do meditation, other people do, you know, psychedelic experiences, et cetera. I think those are great. I do think that there's a ton of value in having that trainer for your mind as well. And I can't imagine at this point for the rest of my life, not having that, you know, um, that trainer as a part of my journey. You told me that you had, um, you had chronic insomnia at yeah. the same time, right? You said like, I was feeling nothing when I raised these series B's and had all these accolades and, uh, that you needed, I think about one year of therapy to reverse it, reverse yeah. this problem. What did you learn uh, from going to therapy an entire year to solve a single issue? Yeah. So, um, chronic insomnia, it, it can manifest in various ways. Some people have difficulty falling asleep. Other people have difficulty staying asleep. Other people have both. <laughs> so, um, mine was the result of, uh, I would say Silicon Valley startup culture and me kind of full throttling it too hard, but that's kind of standard for any startup founder. Like you're going to work a lot. It's going to be super stressful. Like that is the job mm. where the chronic insomnia manifested from was 
uh, and this is what I learned from my therapist and did, I went way deep on this thing. Um, so what I was doing was, and I'm sure a lot of the folks watching this and listening probably do this. I was on my laptop in bed, <laughs> right? I mean, How yeah. many of you are on your laptop in bed or your phone? Oh, the phone right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Probably all of you or most of you. Um, and it turns out that your, your body will, uh, in, so, so the bed is meant for sleep and sex. That's it. You shouldn't even watch TV. You shouldn't be reading books. I know that people are going to be like, what the fuck? You can't read books. Like, come on, I'm in bed. And like, technically you should be using a bed for sleep and sex only. That's it. And if you start to do things like work, which is stressful, even if it's good stress, your, your, your body is in a state when you're working that is not rest, right? And so if the place where you're supposed to be resting is now a place where you're, where you're working, mm. your body psychosomatically develops this condition that this bed is not safe for rest. And so what happened to me was I would try to go to bed and I couldn't fall asleep. My body was like, why would I fall asleep here? All you do is work here, right? But if I, if I sat on the couch and turned on Netflix, I would fall asleep in 20 minutes. Like it instantly, because my body was like, you don't, this is safe. You can go to sleep here, right? And so the way that I ended up reversing it was um, when I was on the couch and I started to feel like I was falling asleep, I had to stand up and watch TV. Basically retrain the body that this is not a place that you go to sleep. Wow. And it took months. Wow. So imagine you're sitting on your couch and you're kind of like dozing off and you have to stand up and finish watching TV. It's a pain in the ass, but it, I know it's crazy, right? But it works. And so, and then conversely, the second that you get tired, you have to go straight to bed, like straight away. It's just, you, you go into bed, you close your eyes and try to fall asleep. And it took about a year of doing that. And then, you know, I went really deep. It's like white noise is super important, like blackout shades. If you don't have blackout shades, a sleeping mask. Absolutely. And then I even went further and bought a sleep eight, which I am like, I, I don't have any investment in this company or whatever, but like it is a game changer for sleep. What is it? So it's this, and I'm probably gonna butcher this. So sleep eight folks or eight sleep, whatever it's called, don't hate on me. Um, <laughs> Cause I bought two of them at this point. So it's this, it's a cover that you put over your bed and it has hoses that connect to it that have water flowing through it. Mm. And uh, it has all of these sensors to basically monitor what you, you sleep. And it will, over time, using um, AI, AI models, determine the optimal temperature throughout the night so that you get super deep REM wow. sleep, as well as like slowly waking your body up. So the alarm clocks, like I am not a fan of like eh, 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 those types of alarm. I, those are just like the worst way to wake up. You know, you're like in this deep sleep and all of a sudden you're jolted out of it. That's not a good way to wake up. What does it do instead? It will slowly heat the bed up. And then that slowly wakes your body up. And then it can also have these like vibrating pulses and whatnot. And so I find that, you know, when I travel and I sleep at hotels, I get way less deep sleep, which probably most people do. I'm like, I would say, I would stay at a hotel hundred percent of the time if it had sleep aid as an option, because you can tune it to how you want to sleep and how you need to sleep. There's an account you set up, all this kind of stuff. Again, I'm not chilling this. I'm telling you this works for me Amazing. and it's phenomenal. And since I've done that, coupled with the white noise and the, you know, blackout shades and, you know, uh, not eating a few hours before you go to bed, all these types of things, right? I have gotten some of the best recovery and sleep ever. And, uh, you know, fortunately I have not slipped back into a form of chronic insomnia, irrespective of how volatile the crypto markets have become. <laughs> So you manage to sleep well despite the madness of the industry you're in. Yep. That's Which right. Which is pretty solid. <laughs> it shows that your, your <laughs> sleep biohacking works. Yeah. I mean, look, like, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I think this probably gets back to some of the childhood related stuff. Like when you, when you're, when you're kind of like in a, not a constant, but a consistent state of destabilization, you're effectively thrown into volatile environments because you're, you know, whether it's the, the physical relocation itself, the new kid at school, pick your reason, right? There's a level of destabilizing volatility associated with that type of an upbringing that is like when the markets are volatile, I feel, I feel so good. Like the past six months have been like this choppy range or whatever. Like it's been horrible because I'm like, yeah. there's nothing going on mm -hmm. when the markets are actually moving. That's when me and my trading partner, who's also very good at trading volatility, like we thrive in those types of environments. And so I think crypto being arguably the most volatile asset class in history to date is perfectly primed for someone like myself.
You thrive in chaos? Uh, I thrive in, I would probably change that to thrive in volatility. Chaos is, the thing about chaos is that it's very difficult to define what it is and also kind of like manage the risk around chaos. Chaos is like, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. There is no way to accurately describe what a chaotic environment is. Mm -hmm. Whereas a volatile environment, I think is more like, there is some constraint around the environment, but there's this kind of injected, like, you know, anxiety almost into it or something, right? And, it, and I don't mean like the price is going down or price is going up. It just means that there is this level of uh, volatility that juices whatever that environment is like, whereas chaos you don't know anything about it. It's very difficult to kind of manage. I think in that environment for frankly, anybody. You thrive in volatility. Mm -hmm. And you love big, all. You're a big fan of uh, Nassim Nicola Taleb. That's Why? right. Why? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I know he's kind of an asshole on the internet, but, um, <laughs> he's an asshole to Bitcoin too, right? Yeah. I mean, but like, whatever. I mean, this is like par for the course for him. I think if you can remove kind of the personality from the writing and, and understand I think more deeply some of the principles that he outlines in his books. Um, it has had a life changing effect on myself. And so I, I've, I read, I've read everything by him. So like black Swan, full by randomness, anti-fragile skin in the game, et cetera. Um, and the, the interesting things about Talib to me that stand out are, I think I was kind of already thinking the stuff that he more eloquently articulated in his books. Um, so I'll give you an example, right? Like um, you will see, you see this all the time on traditional financial media where they're like, the stock market was up today because of a blah, 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 blah. That is utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's, there's no, like there's absolutely no way you can pinpoint a reason for say something like a market to be up or down. People can have informed opinions or they can have some probabilistic, you know, outcome that they're thinking as to why it was this way or that, but you're actually fooled by the randomness of a market, right? Like for example, if I told you Nvidia blew out their earnings by 20% and raised their forward guidance, what do you think would happen to their stock? Go up. It would go up, right? Yeah, what happens when it goes down? <laughs> Everybody was wrong because yeah. they thought, you know, oh, well, they just blew out this, that, whatever. And so my point is, is that, you know, it's good to have an informed view as to things like this. But in reality, there's so much stochastic randomness in, say, markets or in life in general that associating something with you think that you think has absolute certainty is ridiculous. And I think this is another thing that kind of stands out to me about crypto and spe specifically is that a lot of folks will try to take these models that have worked in other industries, particularly traditional finance, mm -hmm. and kind of shoehorn yeah. them into crypto. And I'm like, it doesn't work. It, it absolutely does not work. There is like using a price to earnings ratio. Now it's great to have a framework. Yeah. I'm not suggesting you should have a framework and I'm not just, you know, shitting on anybody that uses these types of, of these uh, methodologies or whatnot, but it's an entirely new set of principles for how this asset class works. So why aren't you starting from first principles as opposed to being like, well, I learned this thing in business school and it applies to this type of a company. And therefore, let me use the price to earnings ratio and determine the discount for kind of cash flow. And therefore the value of Aave's token is radically undervalued. And it's like, yeah, but no one gives a shit. So sorry. <laughs> but one day it will work. Uh, people are just too stupid to understand uh, yet, right? They will learn. Yeah, I mean. Do you, do you believe in that? Or do you think it's like a completely different just way of working in crypto? Yeah, I mean, look, there's, that's, it's a great question because I've thought about this a lot and I don't take the contrarian viewpoint just to be contrarian. That's, that's pretty lame. Mm. I, but like, I, I just tend to think about this stuff from a first principles perspective and try to pattern match in other ways. And so like, I have this concept that I call like broad spectrum pattern recognition, where in pattern recognition, you can have like, if you're playing poker, right? Like there's some patterns you can recognize there. Or if you're a trader on Wall Street, there's, and you're at the trading desk, there's patterns that you can recognize in the, in the, in the order flow. But to take patterns that existed historically in other industries or concepts and then apply them to new things to try to forecast what could be in the future, that's what I mean by broad spectrum pattern recognition. And so what I look at is something like, hey, um, instead of looking at crypto and being like, it's the digital you know, version of finance or whatever, like 
that's not actually what this is. If you zoom out a little bit and you go back to say the 1990s and, uh, if you were around back then and you were like a teenager or whatever, you were buying mu music via CDs, maybe even cassette tapes, depending on how old you are. But the CDs were controlled by more or less an oligopoly of record labels. And they picked the music that you got to basically listen to. And they cho this chose the distribution of that. And certainly I'm giving you a more US centric lens, but this is likely applicable to the broader kind of developed world. <clears throat> and people were kind of fed up. They're like, wait a second, these record labels are making these massive profit margins. They're, you know, putting out the same type of music because it's like this kind of factory model that kind of they spit through and it, and it works. What if we want something else? And also, why are we paying so much money for these things, like, et cetera, et cetera? And so what happened was Napster. Napster came out and said, hey, like, here's the current system that people are opting into because it's really the only thing that exists for music production, distribution, et cetera. We're going to create an alternative system. It doesn't mean that, that like this is necessarily bad. It's just that we want to have choice. And well, what happened to the music industry? At first they ignored it. Then they laughed at it. And then they fought it in court and then streaming won. right? The entire music industry is radically reshaped is unrecognizable versus what it was in the 1990s, which kind of makes sense. It's been 25 plus years or whatever, but that alternative system for say, obtaining music, distributing music, producing music, listening to music, purchasing music, right? It was free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, that is now what I see happening with crypto. It's an alternative financial system. The fiat kind of swift banking, you know, uh, tr traditional way of doing money management and access to financial services, that system is likely going to exist for a very long time. But now there's an alternative system that people can opt into. They, they can still actually operate in the old system too, but they can operate in this new system. And so, you know, as you get back to the point of like, Ave or pick a lending protocol or pick a DeFi protocol. I'm not picking on Ave specifically. The point is, it's not what the protocol is and well, how do we get new users and they should just know that this is better and this and that. It's like we're building an alternative financial system. And so, how do you get people to opt into that in a meaningful way? Well, in most cases, and when I worked at this design agency years ago called Frog Design, one of the things that I learned from a lot of the user experience researchers there was in order for people to make a fundamental change in how they do anything, it needs to be a 10x improvement. Mm. There is not a 10x improvement currently for most people in the developed world to adopt DeFi protocols. It just doesn't exist. However, if you go to developing countries or countries that have, you know, history of the, comp the countries defaulting on their debt or, you know, seizing of their assets or whatever that may actually be, those folks are adopting this stuff because they, they need to opt out of the system because they don't want to, you know, kind of remain in this ridiculous uh, inequality gap that continues to kind of uh, build itself out irrespective of what happens with, you know, sort of the developed nations themselves. Why should anyone listen to you? They shouldn't. Absolutely not. I'm just some guy on the internet. I mean, it's so funny, honestly, like this is probably like my skeptic coming in, but you know, uh, when people ask me for like for advice or when I say stuff on Twitter, I'm like, do not take advice from me or literally anyone ev anywhere at any time. Like think for yourself. Um, I don't think people should listen to me hundred percent. That's so, that's so important. Think for yourself. What does that mean? And why should everyone think for themselves? So, I mean, <laughs> oh, how much time do we have? No. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's more depending on you than on me. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. I know I do have a, uh, another meeting. But um, so why should everyone think for themselves? Um, I think that a lot of folks get comfort in consistency, tradition, um, frankly, candidly being told what to do. It's just easier for a lot of folks. And, you know, I'm not suggesting that those folks should change their lives to be like, yeah, you should just like be independent and think for yourself. But I do think that there's, folks out there that are probably listening that res that will re this will resonate with that there's something intrinsic about in independent thinkers or folks that are, I think, somewhat um, anti-establishment or contrarian in the way that they view the world that change the world. And um, those are the folks that will eventually be leading the folks that need to be led. 
And I think that if folks have this sort of intrinsic feeling about their view of the world or they, the way that they want to express their will to power, which is another Nietzsche concept, um, they have to think for themselves. And I do think that there is value in, you know, tradition and community aspects, like whether it's, you know, you're, you're living in a particular neighborhood or you maybe attend a particular religious group or activity or what. I think there's a lot of value in that. But there's also a lot of um, nef nefarious activity that comes with those type of group things. So you could look at like the history of cults. You could look at um, pick a war that was triggered by, say, you know, religious um differences, uh, people kind of blindly following others is not, I would say on balance positive in the most cases for society, it requires critical thinking and independent thinking. And more importantly, I think it actually starts at a childhood level. If you are indoctrinated from the very beginning to, you know, believe in a particular like political value set or religious value set, you as a child actually haven't developed the brain well enough to make a decision on your own. And so a lot of people don't ever break out of that conditioning from their indoctrination. And I can't really blame them. That's why I say, should everybody think for themselves? I'm like, I'm not sure everybody can, depending on how indoctrinated they were as children. And so as that changes over time, and some people kind of like break away from that, the world kind of opens up in a different way. And you end up with, you know, folks that are, I think, radically changing the world for the, for the good. Do you think we're moving to the right direction to have more people thinking for this, themselves? Oh, of course. And I mean, <clears throat> I think one of the benefits of like having this type of a conversation is, If you talk to people like on the internet, I was remember I was talking with somebody in a telegram chat the other day and he's like, why is everybody so upset? I'm like, it's the internet. No one is happy. Like it's come on. Like it's the, it's the, it's the way people operate on the internet. Like you could airdrop everybody a million dollars cash and someone would complain about it. Yeah. It's just inevitable. Right. <laughs> and so like, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think that uh, there's sort of a, a, a solution to that. Um, but if if we sort of think about how we could be happier <laughs> as a community, uh, maybe things would change for the better. Hey, when shift happens, family. Time to toast our partner, Divin. They're taking luxury wine to the blockchain with their super fun concept called Uncork to Earn. Buy your favorite wines, enjoy unique experiences, and get an airdrop each time you open a bottle with your friends. Cheers to Divin for bringing transparency, authenticity, and exclusivity to the fine wines industry. So I asked you, why should people listen to you? You said they shouldn't. But you believe in yourself, and you're doing pretty well with that. You're an asymmetric, the world uh, top performing fund in 2023. I know that you're not a big fan of books for investing, right? <laughs> But I read one that is really good, A Random Walk Down Wall Street mm -hmm. by Bertrand Markiel. And if I remember well, one of the concepts I remember, I read it many, many years ago, uh, probably 10 years ago. One of the key concepts was that fund's performance should be analyzed over 20 plus years, right? And that the best performing funds over the long, uh, the long term rarely perform extremely well during certain year, the more like number three, four, five, you never really see them. Whereas the ones that perform extremely well, usually um, they catch all the eyeballs one year and then they end up having a dreadful performance the following year. How do you avoid being one of the latter? Uh, you don't drift from your style. So <clears throat> look, I mean, we launched the fund in late 2022. Mm. did really well in 2023. We were, we were not trying to be number one. We were informed of that, which was awesome. And we're not trying to be number one again this year. We maintain the same type of style. I think what happens in a lot of cases, and I mean, I certainly, oh, this is my first fund, so I'm not like the Oracle here. Right. Mm. But I think what tends to happen with a lot of, you know, called hedge fund managers, portfolio managers, traders, whatever is they have some mo modicum of success. And then they try to recreate that success by drifting away from what they're good at. We don't do that, right? So I'll give you a prime example. Um, this has upset a lot of people, but it has served us very well. Like we have owned zero Ethereum all year in 2024 and will not own any for the rest of the year. Why? Not because we hate Ethereum, but because we had a view that Ethereum will underperform Bitcoin and Solana this year. Very simple. We could, we could be still wrong about that, mm. but so far we have been correct. And so by 
watching what happened in Ethereum in January. So the, the ETF news comes out and Ethereum ripped. We could have chased that. How did you feel at that moment? Fine. Because if anything, it was evidence to us that there is demand for the next ETF. And so if Ethereum gets approved as an ETF, what do you think the next ETF is going to be? Right? So we had that kind of thing happen. And my point is there have been moments throughout the year where Ethereum has had these kind of you know, idiosyncratic spikes and have outperformed Bitcoin and Solana in a very short period of time, we could have drifted from our style and said, let's go buy a bunch of Ethereum call spreads and then they would be worthless. Or we maintain focus on what we're doing. 100%. And in doing that, hopefully we avoid being, you know, a one hit wonder. It could still be the case. I'm completely okay with that. I'm not going to modify my strategy or style based on the AUM we have, the type of LPs we have, or the environment that we're in. We keep managing risk the exact same way, irrespective of any of those factors. I think it applies pretty well to like any kind of business, right? Entrepreneurship. You, re you usually start with a niche or an idea, and then you get better and better, and it's very tempting to kind of diversify or people start to come with a lot of great ideas. For example, this podcast, people say, hey, you should do conferences because of all the guests you have. You should do a fund, you should do this and that. And I'm like, that's the playbook, right? Everyone does <laughs> that. I'm like, why would I not just double down and become the best podcast in the space and see what happens? And maybe it's wrong, but at least I'm kind of comfortable with what I'm doing. A hundred percent agree. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll put it to you this way, right? So we have an early stage venture capital fund as well as a early stage Bitcoin kind of DeFi meta protocol fund. And in the early stage venture capital fund that's been fully deployed, um, you know, we launched in 2022. I've spoke with myriad founders that are, you know, some of them have made the mistake of chasing the next new shiny thing and others have laser focused on their core product. And even like the sponsor of this podcast, Jupiter, right? When these guys laser focused on creating the best swapping capability on Web3 period, now they have a foundation and the user base that ex has an expectation of what the experience is going to be like for a Jupiter product. Now look at all the products they have, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, hey, we're going to do a lending protocol. We're going to do a stable coin. We're going to do NFT trading. We're going to do per perpetual exchange. Like you've already lost. And I think that that is the same uh, application to what you're describing with your podcast. Yes, you could do a fund. Yes, you could do a conference, but why not be the best po podcast and then maybe see incrementally where you, you know, branch out in, in forms of media, if it makes sense to you. Mm. Absolutely. One of the main reasons your fund performs so well is your understanding of the Solana ecosystem early on and of the meme coin potential. You said is my first fund, right? But you said also, you develop this judgment throughout the years, which you, you call pattern... Pattern recognition or pattern matching. Exactly, yeah. pattern matching. What previous bad or catastrophic events or patterns in your investing, trading, or entrepreneurship career helped you recognize that the FTX collapse was an opportunity and not the end for Solana? Yeah, oh man, what a great question. Um, so... <laughs> I think I take a deep breath because uh, it, it's just like remembering that time was just insane. I'm sure that was for everybody that was involved. Um, I'll put it to you this way. Like <laughs> my, myself, my trading partner, when, when F, when the, the kind of rumblings about the issues at FTX were happening, in fact, <laughs> it was at Breakpoint in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. um, we were about to fly home and we were starting to hear some rumblings and believe it or not, um, we were actually short, the market heading into October into Q4 that year. We were, and people can like read our market updates. We have all the receipts. Like we were bearish, super bearish from a macro perspective. And we were expressing that through being, you know, long Bitcoin put spreads. Um, the day that uh, the kind of shit hit the fan with FTX, so things were worth a fortune. However, we've seen this movie before with mm -hmm. the global financial crisis. And what I think a lot of people, especially, you know, younger folks that weren't necessarily trading during GFC may not be aware of is a concept called counterparty risk or embedded credit risk in your counterparties. So we trade with a lot of broker dealers with options like these, these put spreads. But what happens if that broker dealer is bankrupt, right? And you have a position on with them. Well, you get to go through a bankruptcy proceeding. No one wants to do that, especially when you just launched your fund. And so what we did is we flattened our, ent our entire book. Our dealers knew what we were doing and they gave us shitty pricing that's the, that's the business. But we, you know, we, we were like, shoot first, ask questions later. And 
when um, we started to see the pile on of shorts uh, with anything that was associated with FTX, Solana was the clearest thing that was wildly associated with FTX, rightfully so. It is a uh, blockchain technology that jump trading is also involved in, right? So it's not a surprise that if a former employee of Jane Street, which is a competitor to jump, saw the technology of Solana and wanted to be associated with it in a meaningful way, that it would make sense that Solana would actually also get hammered as FTX was kind of imploding. We saw it as a major opportunity, mostly because um, the fundamentals of Solana had not changed, right? They have come to a blockchain from a very different set of first principles, which is, you know, we want to be optimizing global state at the speed of light, right? We want to be the NASDAQ for blockchain. That has trade-offs in the way that you design the system, like any system, you're going to have trade-offs. And the fundamentals for Solana had not changed. What had changed? The price. And so if we zoomed out and we were like, okay, earlier in 2022, we knew there was going to be an aggressive tightening policy by the Federal Reserve, as well as other central banks globally, that's going to hammer risk assets. There's going to be certain price levels that we are going to be comfortable owning certain assets, no matter what happens. And those price levels, believe it or not, with Solana were between eight and $11. Mm. And so we started buying Solana when it was trading down 11, 10, nine, and then just kind of closed our eyes and shoved all in at eight <laughs> yeah. because the fundamentals had not changed. My, my view has been since 2019 that in order for this kind of new form of technology, call it smart contract programming, call it blockchain, decentralized finance, whatever it is, you have to have an underlying operating system or you know system, the, the L1, if you will, be deterministic on cost and deterministic for the user experience. And Solana is, to this day, maybe there's some other L1s that have adopted kind of a parallelized uh, approach like, you know, Aptos and Sui, Say, we're investors in Say, like, but at the time it was only Solana. And so, you know, there's a first mover advantage there, as well as having, you know, arguably like some pretty sophisticated applications that were built and being built. And so as I looked at it, I thought, look, I could be dead wrong on the adoption of blockchain in general, or, you know, web three applications, maybe I'm wrong there. But the fastest horse is Solana. It's not going to be Ethereum. And this is back in 2022 when there wasn't like, the, like they were still talking about their scaling solutions. A lot of them had rolled out yet. And I still believed that, hey, look, you know, I have a software development background. What you're looking at between Solana and what, what people are calling a modular architecture, which is actually a service-oriented architecture, there's trade-offs with those as well. And I've seen those play out in previous patterns, right? Service-oriented architecture has been around since the 1970s. This is not a new concept in software development. There's hardcore trade-offs when you move from a monolithic stack to a service-oriented architecture, period, end of story. I still believe that a monolith is actually the best way to scale a blockchain today. And that was the case when we bought it at eight bucks in 2022. And so the long-winded answer is, it's a combination of all this set of experiences that I had in, say, traditional markets, understanding various forms of risk, managing that risk, but also making sure that I was comfortable expressing a view when price hit a certain level because the fundamentals hadn't changed. You think in terms of probabilities, right? Uh -huh. What was the probability we were assigning to Solana being successful at that moment? Oh, uh, very high, 80%, 90%. What's the worst that could have happened to you and your fund had you been wrong? The 10, 20%. I mean, the worst thing that could have happened is the price of Solana would have kept going down, right? Um, and we also have a risk-adjusted way of doing that where, you know, like I think one of the things that we kind of, um, I've done for my entire trading career, 24 years, is I don't get into a trade unless I know the exit mm -hmm. in advance. And I mean that in both directions, right? So for example, if, if Solana is trading eight, we sold puts um, uh, at a $7 strike price for like, I don't know, it was like a month out or something, <clears throat> end of year, maybe it was December. And had we got put to it, uh, we would have had to basically buy Solana at like $6.10. We were comfortable owning Solana at $6.10. Now, if it had kept going, well, then we would have had to stop out at a certain level. Hmm. Fortunately, we collected the premium from selling the put and it went to 25 bucks in like a month, right? And we had also put on a risk reversal call spread and nailed that 2025 spread. So we were pretty good with our probabilities of, mm. and the accuracy in the short-term trading, right? Had it gone the other direction, we would have stopped out. And this is, I think, one of the mistakes a lot of traders or investors make is they struggle with this concept that every human being has, which is loss aversion. Mm. And if you apply like your emotions or, you know, thinking that you're right and the market's telling you wrong, the market's going to keep telling you you're wrong until you actually, you know, commit to it.
I usually never ask about price prediction because this podcast is really not about that. <laughs> But <laughs> oh, I have a good answer for you. What's your? I mean, I'm a big Solana believer. Also, since last year, I was a bit later, like twenty dollars. I think seventeen dollars. Nice. Uh, thanks to Raul Pal, Akshay, and uh, Chris Berinsky. Shout out. Um, where do you see Sol going this cycle in a bearish, base case, and bullish scenario? Yeah. And you can maybe uh, talk about macro, right? Because it's probably linked to your macro outlook. Yeah. So, I mean, um, whenever somebody asks me for a price target, my answer is always the same. It's higher. And the reason I say that is because price targets were invented by Wall Street to sell shit. Mm -hmm. They are easy little like quips of information that pretty much anyone that isn't a sophisticated investor can be like, oh, this really smart guy in a suit on Wall Street has told me that the price of IBM stock is going to be $300. That's their price target. Mm -hmm. And it's only 200, you know, that's a 50% return. That's potential. why I'm asking to this uh, smart guy uh, in a t-shirt <laughs> with tattoos. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is why I'm telling you, Price targets are nonsense, everybody. Like they make for great headlines. Like I'm telling you right now, my PR agent really wants me to be putting price targets of like Solana at a thousand bucks. Like she really wants me to be doing that because of course. every media outlet would be like, oh, hedge fund manager Joe McCann says Solana is going to a thousand and they all print it and it's meaningless, right? And so this is what my point is, is that with price targets, I don't view, you know, Is Solana going to a thousand? Sure. Is it going to 500? Probably. Is it going to six bucks? No. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of ridiculous. And so what we have is not so much a like bear base bull case on the price of soul. What we have is a macro view and we use that to inform how we express it like through crypto. So crypto, in our opinion, and I think Raul probably agrees with this, is the best expression of macro today, period. Yeah. End of story. There is no better risk adjusted return than Bitcoin. And then anything that's bit baited to Bitcoin does extremely well as well. And so our view on the macro landscape shouldn't be a surprise. It's consistent with what Raul sees um, is we think that we're not even remotely close to the end of a global liquidity cycle. We think that there's a chance that global liquidity probably tops at some point in the second half of 2025. Could it keep going? Absolutely, right? Like this is a forecast. I think the other thing to note is there's significant structural changes in kind of the, you know, I would say power brokers of countries around the world right now. Um, China has a major demand issue internally. Their domestic demand is effectively zero. That's a problem. Um, they're an export heavy country. That's great. But lacking internal domestic demand, that's an issue. Russia has, um, you know, with the Ukraine conflict kind of isolated themselves to a certain extent that the energy that they produce can no longer be upgraded with modern equipment because they can't get it. That is also choking them from the inside, right? Um, if you look at what's happening in the United States, we have some of the biggest CapEx investment projects happening probably in our history in 2025. That's going to continue to drive GDP in the United States continue to drive consumption, which should be, you know, help folks like China that are export heavy businesses. But the point that I'm making is, uh, there is a, there is an opportunity likely in 2025 that could extend into 2026 where risk assets inflate to levels that would follow a four year cycle. Could we be wrong? Absolutely. What would be different this time, right? A lot of people get really hung up on the fractal nature of Bitcoin in these four-year cycles. I think one of the big key differences this time is that we finally have the institutionalized products associated with Bitcoin. What happens when BlackRock owns the majority of all Bitcoin? Do we know what that looks like? Has anybody probabilistically weighed that outcome? What does that mean for, you know, the floor or the bid? People are like, oh, Bitcoin's going to rip the 250K and then crash 70%. It's like, really? Hmm. How's that going to happen if BlackRock is holding the majority of Bitcoin? They're not going to let that happen in theory, right? So, 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 your, so, your, so your idea is maybe it does happen, but always have, always express your portfolio in a way where there is a probability that it doesn't happen, right? That's correct. Sa same as you did with Solana at the bottom. Like, how do I kind of hedge myself or protect myself in case 
any of the potential outcome happen. Yeah. And I mean, look, this is also like asymmetric. You know, I, I tend to tell people we're a macro shop dressed up in crypto clothing. Uh, my trading partner, mm. 20 plus years, global macro across asset, across geo. I have macro experience. He has significantly more. But the way that we think about our, our vehicle is like, we're actually a macro fund. Mm. We just happen to use crypto as the key expression. There is a case to be made that we over-index and we, we have the latitude to do this at asymmetric where we could be like, hey, instead of, you know, 95% of our portfolio trading crypto products, why don't we shift that to, I don't know, 30% and 70% we go trade interest rates, FX, mm -hmm. you know, these types of things, because we know how to trade those. And in the case that there is kind of a stalling out or a, a blow off top in crypto, and there's going to be, you know, a winter or bear market again, uh, probably makes sense to actually have exposure to macro products because unless you're just going to be naked short or in cash, you know, my investors aren't going to want me to just hold their cash. So maybe there's an opportunity for us to actually kind of shift our, our perspective away from the expression of macro being crypto to macro being macro. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of how we're positioning ourselves for the second half of 2025. You said we are a macro shop dressed with crypto clothes, right? Correct. There's probably no better way to say it that to say that than your sort of trademark thesis, which is depression or dog coins to a trillion dollars. <laughs> That's right. Can you explain? Yes. Uh, I wish I was, you know, clever enough to have coined that phrase. Um, but you Who know, coined it? good artists create. Uh, great artist steal. So mm -hmm. uh, I stole that from a friend who will go unnamed. He's actually a very talented uh, macro portfolio manager at a very large hedge fund, Tradify hedge fund in New York. Mm. And um, the concept of it is pretty simple. While we were going through this, this sort of incredibly aggressive tightening cycle by the Fed and other central banks, particularly the Fed, we were, we were watching what was happening going at some point, the rate policy is going to be so restrictive that either uh, the Federal Reserve is going to drive the United States into a full-blown depression, mm. or they have to print money, which means that all the dog coins go to a trillion dollar market cap. And I was like, depression or dog coins to a trillion. And I was like, holy shit, that's actually spot on mm. with the, the conundrum that Jerome Powell faces at the head of the Fed. And so it's a quippy tagline, you know, it's stuck. <laughs> I'm going to keep it for a while, guys until we see, you know, it either be invalidated or dog coins actually hit a trillion. And then I'll do an incredibly cringeworthy victory lap. But the truth in that statement could not be more obvious as to what's happening in the United States today. And so, for example, and maybe around the world, but I'll speak from a U.S. perspective lens. <clears throat> there is a, uh, you know, we've written about this, this concept of what a bimodal distribution is. Most people know like the standard bell curve, the standard distribution um, that's how most economic data is presented. They say on average, the GDP is this, or on average, credit card delinquencies are that, or on average, you know, mortgages are this and that. The reality is that in the United States specifically, there's, it's not one bell curve, it's two. And there's the people that are struggling and there's people that are doing very, very well. And the economy is very much set up this way. And so the folks that are not necessarily doing that great, they would rather throw 500 bucks at a meme coin and hopefully turn it into a few hundred thousand or a couple million, which the media loves to cover. Don't you guys, you love to cover those headlines <laughs> as opposed to, you know, let me put $500 into a T bill that earns me 5%. Well, what's 5% annualized on 500 bucks. So small, it doesn't matter. Now, if you've got 5 million bucks, 5% a year, pretty good especially when the rate of inflation is two and a half, your real rate is call it two and a half percent. You're getting two and a half real yield for doing nothing but holding US debt. Those other people, they don't have that option. They've got 500 bucks. What are they going to do? They're going to do a four team parlay on DraftKings because the football season is back in full swing or they're going to buy meme coins. And this is a concept that uh, I think loosely is called like financial nihilism. And that is not going away. I think it also is, per, is, is permeating throughout the kind of global zeitgeist, particularly with the younger generations, but it is absolutely the case in the United States. And so if that doesn't change, um, you will see people gravitate towards the dog coins when the Fed actually has to print because that's their only way out. You're talking about the little guy who would throw 500 bucks into a meme coin, right? 
but you invest for the big boys and you throw money into the dog coins. That's right. Why? Really simple. <laughs> my job as a hedge fund manager is to generate returns to my LPs. Let me be super clear about this. Like no one starts a hedge fund to change the world. Mm. Like it just a hedge fund is to generate money. Venture capital fund, yeah, okay. You'll see VCs say to you things like, we back the founders that are here to change the world. No, you're not. That's actually not true. I'm sorry, guys. That is nonsense. The reality is like VCs won't say what I'm saying because they, they know it's true. VCs raise money from limited partners. Limited partners put money into their fund Absolutely. and they say, I want a return on this. And so when a VC tends to invest in a, a business, your business model becomes their business model and their business model is generated returns. And if you don't meet their business model, guess what? They will find ways to make sure that you're not in business anymore or you have to get really, really lucky, right? And so with what I'm doing at the hedge fund side, um, yeah, we're here to generate returns for our LPs. There, there is no way to like sugarcoat that. That is literally the job. And so what I look for is not the investments that are going to make me look good on a panel at a conference. I look for investments that are going to generate returns. Mm. And I think at Asymmetric, we're kind of at the intersection of technology, culture, and capital. Mm. That is a very rare combination. And it's obviously very self-serving for me to say that. But that is what has enabled us to have those types of returns that we had in 2023 because a lot of the performance drivers were macro driven, expressed through crypto, but also understanding culture and that being expressed through crypto. So as an example, um, we were very early to bonk and still are huge supporters and holders of bonk. Hmm. I had identified in October major capitulation event on bonk. It looked like someone had just finally said, I can't take it anymore. Just dumped as much as they possibly could. When you see that it's a form of capitulation. That's a pattern that exists in trading and investing, et cetera. Typically when you see that level of capitulation, the price goes up. The last seller has sold. That's when bottoms actually form. And so that was number one. Number two was we were actually approaching Q4, which is historically a great quarter for crypto in general. Number three, we had the Solana Breakpoint conference coming up. Number four, I built some proprietary software in-house at Asymmetric that allowed me to see kind of block order flows across the spot exchanges and started to see these kind of huge prints hitting the tape. And number five, we did on-chain forensic analysis of stablecoin flows into Solana. My view was if Solana is going to go break through the, the kind of FTX implosion level and start ripping, people are going to migrate to Solana. We're already starting to see that with stablecoin flows. Well, if they're going to be buying Solana and they own Solana and the value of Solana goes up, well, they're going to want to lever against that. What are they going to buy? A dog coin. Mm -hmm. What's the dog coin on uh, Solana? Bonk. Bonk also has an incredible story behind it. Like it's like Netflix quality story behind it. That's very easy for people to kind of get behind. Lo and behold, it was a 20, $28 million market cap that went to $2 billion, right? Did we get lucky? Sure. Was it an informed probability? Yes. And I think that that is one of the reasons why when we talk about com the comfort in owning meme coins, celeb coins, you know, shit coins, you name it, because our LPs don't care as long as we're doing it in a risk managed way. And the last thing I'll mention about this is that we do manage the risk of these types of assets in a very strict way. So we have what's called a concentration risk policy where any asset that is in the top 20 by market cap, at most, we can spend 2% of the funds AUM on it. Mm. Why? Let's say you have $100 million and you spend $50 million on bonk and you're wrong. Mm. You're fucked. Mm. If you spend $2 million bucks and it drops you know, 50%, it's not the end of the world. If it goes up 100x, you just crushed it. Ask Yao Wang. Um, he was early in, in WIF, right? Mm -hmm. Ask him, do you still hold WIF? He says, no. Why? He says, I'm not sure it outperforms Solana in the future. Mm -hmm. And I want to put that in, I want to ask you the same question, right? Because you say I own bank. And I want to put that into um, the framework of the question would be depression or dog coins for a trillion dollars. So I'm basically asking you depression or dog coins for a trillion dollars. <laughs> dog coins for a trillion, for sure. No, no doubt about it. For sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, let me, let, let's like unpack that a little bit more, right? So, um, in the United States, the federal government is a business and the way that they generate income, there's like a handful of ways. There's tariffs, which are small, which could change under Trump administration. There's tariffs, but then there's taxes and, if, and taxes is the majority of the income for the most part for the U S government. Well, if you look into the types of taxes that they receive, 
the largest amount of income that they receive is from capital gains. What are capital gains? That's when you buy an investment, it goes up in value, and you have to pay either short-term or long-term capital gains. I'm not a tax professional, but this is like loosely the understanding of how this works, okay? When, how does the government ensure that they keep having revenue from capital gains? They have to inflate the value of assets. So like, let that wash over you. The U.S. government so good. has to inflate the value of assets to get capital gains tax revenue. Why is nobody saying this? What percentage of the revenue for the government is the capital gains versus the other? Is it a huge chunk? Yes. Okay. Yes. Like and have- like, I mean, this could again change mm. with say, you know, Trump has, I think if he, if he becomes president again, and he follows through on his tariff plan, like that could fundamentally change. Um, but yeah, the majority of the tax revenue comes from, or excuse me, the majority of the revenue for the federal government comes from taxes, period. And I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Uh, I'm sure somebody will gladly fact check me in the, in the comments, but ultimately that is their business model. And so once you kind of understand the, the plumbing of this system, you can look at it and go, so, hmm. Mm, Um, the value of homes, what is the value of all the U.S. homes in the United States? It's some trillions of dollars. Okay. Uh, yeah. What if that drops 10% in value? What, what, what happens to the capital gains tax? Zero mm. or very small, right? They can't have that. The business is, model is not set up to have assets go down in value. So therefore, depression or dog coins to a trillion, there's actually only one choice. They have to inflate assets. And because Zoomers, a lot of millennials cannot afford to buy a home, guess where they put their money? In things that may enable them to buy a home. <laughs> Dog coins. Dog coins. Now, <laughs> I will say that, you know, the guy who said, I, I don't hold any whiff anymore, like, there is, uh, we haven't even really seen, seen retail come back thus far in this cycle. We've seen, like, little spurts of it. Um Meme coins are like they're they're you can you can press a button and create one like there's it's trivial to create a, a meme coin at this point right the the difference is do you actually have some level of you know utility which I know people hate to associate with meme coins but like sorry Bonk is really good at this Iggy Azalea's mother is really good at this like there are examples of this out there or you have absolutely captured attention and maintained it. Now, there is a self-fulfilling prophecy, like WIF was crazy. It got it captured everybody's attention, but then all the exchange listed did it, all the market makers wanted to trade it. There's all this behind the scenes kind of infrastructure that mechan- mecha- mechanistically rolls out for what becomes a blue chip meme coin. Mm-hmm. Well, now all these market makers like have inventory and there's a bunch of holders of these various meme coins that are blue chips like WIF. They're not going to let this thing go to zero because they make money on the markets and the exchanges make money on it being traded. And then they offer new products because that's their business model. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy mostly when a, when a token ends up like as a blue chip. What I see is like a billion dollar plus market cap because you've got all the other infrastructure in place to ultimately support it. Does that mean that it, that it won't go to zero? No. It just means that the probability is less mm. that it goes to zero. So kind of framework that you're using from what I understand for kind of different things in the world to assign probabilities on where things are going is understand the business model of every actor that is, that is involved and what's their basically incentives. That's it. Really simple. Yep. If you can understand the incentives of the other side, it makes the, the kind of, the picture becomes way less cloudy, you know, and that whether it's understanding like the U.S. government's business model or it's understanding what makes a blue chip meme coin, it's the same thing. And if you understand those incentives, it's a very powerful position to be in. So you bet big on Solana and bet big on, uh, bet big on uh, meme coins. What was asymmetric fund performance in 2023 to earn you the best performing fund in the world award? We were up 193%. And that's, again, with our risk management framework in place. And that's, you know, nine figures of AUM. There are some funds that have reached out and be like, oh, well, we were up 250%. I was like, how much did you have under management? They were like $2 million. I'm like, well, Mm. yeah, like kudos, but add like two zeros to that and see if you can generate that same type of return. It's very difficult. So because you did so well and because you're all in crypto, you're probably the right person to ask to, how do I make it in crypto as a new investor? And you have a bunch of secrets that no media nor people want to hear. (laughs) (laughs) 
So let's take them one by one. The secrets to making it in crypto that no one's that no one wants you to say and no one <laughs> wants to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where do we start? The um, first one, the first one is uh, you need to have skin in the game. That's don't, right. Don't read a book to learn how to trade or invest. Don't go to business school to learn how to build a business. That's right. Yeah. So let me kind of opine on that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I have traders in my Telegram chat, uh, Market Mercenaries Telegram chat, con constantly ask me or DM me, hey, man, you know, really learned a lot from you and whatever. But like, what books did you read to learn how to trade? And I was like, none. <laughs> They're like, what? And I'm like, zero. Uh, you, you don't learn how to be a trader reading a book. Um, it just doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, I think a lot of folks in developed nations, uh, certainly in the United States, assume that, oh, wait, hey, if I just like go study this course and I read these books and I do these exercises, that now I'm going to be able to do X at kind of like a semi-professional, professional way. And it's just not true. Um, in fact, one of my closest friends, um, went to Harvard business school. And I remember I contacted him, man, this must have been like 14, 15 years ago. And I was like, I don't know, man, I feel like I, sh I need to get an MBA. And he's like, Joe, he's like, don't waste your time. He's like, if you want to learn how to start a business, like just start a business. That is actually the best way to learn how to run a business. It's not a, a class or a course or a textbook. It's the same thing with trading. And the reason is that in, a, in an academic vacuum, everything works like it's supposed to. When you actually have skin in the game, like if you want to open a bakery or something, right? Like you have to put your blood, sweat, and tears, your money, your time behind it. It's a very different emotional state than if you're reading a book about how to open a bakery, right? The same thing goes for trading. You can learn, you know, like the vernacular and like the general concepts of things like order flow and technical analysis, but no one's going to teach you from a book how to trade, because trading is, for human beings, very emotional. And the only way to actually understand how to trade is to feel it. Well, how do you feel it? Put your skin in the game. Put your money in the market and make mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Like there's no, you have to do that. And because human beings, by design, we have this emotional construct called loss aversion, where we hate losing more than we enjoy winning. And so when we start to see like a losing investment or a losing trade, you can start to feel it in your gut, right? You start to feel, oh man, this doesn't feel good. I'm losing money. Like what is going on here? And then your brain stops operating in a rational way. And before you know it, you've blown up your account, right? And so part of the, the, the point that I'm making is if someone tells you that you need to take some course online or you need to read a book or you need to go to school for things that, it, that require skin in the game, run from them because they actually are giving you bad advice. The only way to actually learn these types of things that require skin in the game is to put skin in the game. Why do you think there's so much theory and so many courses and out there? Show me the incentives and I'll show you why. Think about it. <laughs> how many YouTube videos exist out there right now teaching you how to be a trader or technical analysis or do yield farming or any of these types of things? Do you think those guys or gals actually care? No, they're trying to get page views. They're trying to get advertising revenue. So the incentive model is set up such that people want the easy button. So they search the internet and go, how do I become a crypto trader? And these things surface and they pop up, right? Great. That's awesome, but that's not actually going to make you a really good trader. And so the media also loves to highlight these types of things. The same incentive model for the broken media system is advertising, is page views, engagement, doesn't even matter the quality or the, or, you know, it's really the quantity of information and people that they end up getting on their site. So if somebody's like, meet the kid who put 800 bucks into WIF and made $2 million, like everybody loves that story. That's a lottery ticket right? That's not actually a thing that's a value to you. And until that incentive model changes, you're just going to see more and more people actually produce that type of content, which goes back to the same thing about price targets. These, these media outlets love price targets because it's like, it's like a cheap hit of dopamine for people that can read that. Yeah. And I don't think that would change anytime soon, unfortunately. And by the way, that kid probably lost the money afterwards, because if he was luck the first time, he probably feels like a god, right? And then it's going to make the mistakes and learn, right? Correct. And the other thing that you said was, regarding the the, the the online courses or it it comes back to what we were saying before, understand their business model and incentive of this party. And then you understand 
why they're doing that and why it's probably not a, the right way to do it, right? Yep. The secret number two, you kind of mentioned it. You need to blow up your account twice. That's right. Why? See, this is another thing that no one's going to tell you because <laughs> when people want to become a trader, do you think that they want to hear, wait, I have to blow up my account twice? That's going to turn off like everybody for the most part, right? You're going to be like, wait, what do you mean? Like, why do I have to blow up twice? Let me explain why. <clears throat> so, because I've done this. <laughs> I wanted to ask. <laughs> yeah, of give, course. Give us the examples yeah, of like yeah. when so, two times you blew up your account. So, oh, they were so long ago. I don't even, I don't even, I just remember the second time doing it. The first time I definitely remember because it was <laughs> unbelievably painful. It was the same God complex. Like, uh, so what happened, I'll just speak to my example. Like this was, oh my goodness. Um, this is a long time ago. These are like Chinese internet IPOs on E-Trade. Like this is so long ago, um, probably 20 years ago. Uh, I saw this IPO for like Baidu or something like that and um, was very, still like relatively new to trading. Um, wasn't doing it professionally, just kind of learning on, on my own. Hadn't really made any money. Didn't really lose a lot of money, but was, you know, trading a decent amount <clears throat> and um, really committed to this IPO. It's like, this thing is going to, this is going to rip out of the gate. I just know it. It's going to be huge. That's what happened. It went for like, it opened and the thing was like 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 120 dollars, something like that. And I bought it at like 40 bucks and sold it like 120. And at that time I was like, I mean, this is way before crypto. That's like unbelievable in the stock market. And also if you're new to trading, you're like, wait a second, I just made like $20,000 in five minutes. Like, how is this even legal? Right? Like, it's <laughs> crazy. And then I fucked up. The next day, I thought it was going to keep going, right? Because I was like, oh, this thing's just going to keep ripping. Nope. And so I bought it and it was going against me. And I was like, shit, okay, I'll buy more. Nope, buy more, buy more. And the thing just plummeted till it blew up the account. I had using leverage at the time, margin. This was a long time ago. So you get a lot more margin than you can get in like the traditional brokers today. And it blew my account up. And I was just shell shocked. I was like, what just happened? I went from like, being on top of the world to being in like a full blown depression. And what I did after that was I spent a considerable amount of time slowly and incrementally building my account back up, putting some pretty solid risk management principles in place. And then an idiosyncratic event blew up my account. I had no control over it. No control. What's an idiosyncratic? So imagine you're long. So in crypto, it's 24 seven in like stocks, you have what call, what's called gap risk, overnight gap risk, because the markets close and they can reopen the next day, right? So I don't remember what the asset or the, the stock was, but um, I was levered long it and some news event came out. I think it would, may have been like a pharmaceutical or biotech stock or something like that. That was super negative news. And it, it gapped down like 40% in the pre-market and just liquidated my account. That taught me a very, very valuable lesson, right? I was like, wait a second, like you did all of these kind of like incremental things to get you to a point where you felt like you had control over it and then you realize you have no control. Mm -hmm. And so once you let go of the control and recognize that there are aspects of the market that you literally have no control over, then I think you're actually ready because instead of trying to outsmart the market or out muscle the market, you kind of have to get in this bizarre flow state with the market. Flow state. And ancient. I think that that takes just a considerable amount of time to develop. In fact, my trading partner at Asymmetric, I was telling him, I think this was, this was uh, earlier this year. Um, you know, Q1 was a ripper this year, but you know, I think it was like some point in Q2, I was, I just, I just messaged him. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm out of the flow state. Like I have to stop trading. I just have to like take a beat because I'm recognizing what I'm doing. And I'm consistently wrong, <laughs> you know, in the, in the short term, these are like baby trades, but like just trying to like get a feel for the market. Like in some cases there's, there's certain tactics you can do as a trader to kind of like test the market. Right. So let's say, you know, you're trading, I don't know, pick an asset like, um, Solana, uh, and you flash like a $2 million bid on the order book and see if it gets hit or do you still, or does that cause the order book to go the other direction? There's little bits of like clues and information there that you can do as a trader. You know, you have to have the capital to do it, of course, but you can see how the market reacts. And I was doing these kind of testing the market, seeing what was going on. And I kept getting the wrong information based on what my view was. I was out of the flow state. And so I said, that's it. 
taking a break. Like, you know, I, I know that this is what's cool about me and my trading partner. We're kind of like, you know, Kobe and Shaq or Jordan and Pippen or, you know, pick your, your athlete duo. Uh, and I knew that he kind of could manage everything while I got reset. And so getting back into the flow state is critically important, but also understanding when you're out of it and not like, you know, I think in like poker, they call it being on tilt or trading, like over trading or something, you know, not trading, being in cash is also a position, mm. right? And it's important to kind of like step away a little bit and tr allow yourself to get back into the flow state because I don't think you can force the flow state. I think it just ends up happening once you kind of start to get into a rhythm with what's happening with the markets. This is kind of linked to mastering your emotions and your guts, right? Correct. So one of the secrets that I wrote is contrary on investing, mastering your emotions and going against what your guts tells you. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, in August of 2024, we had a VAR shock, a value at risk shock. This is when, uh, you know, August 5th, you had <clears throat> Japanese banks opening up like down 21%. You saw crypto get smoked over the weekend then the US equities markets. And then the VIX went from like 26 to 66. And like all these crazy things are happening, right? Um, we love those events. <laughs> we love those types of events because they present enormous opportunity because the majority of people panic. Mm -hmm. And when you panic, there's a lot of opportunity if you're not panicking. Now, I am not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, when I saw Solana go from 190 to 120, mm -hmm. Or, you know, Ethereum from 3,000 to 2,100? Like, that I wasn't a little like, hmm, this doesn't feel so good. But what you develop over time is you, you detach, like, your mental model and framework of thinking from the emotion so that you can look at the emotion. So, for example, when my stomach was churning a little bit and I also hadn't slept because the markets were kind of insane, right? Um, I looked at it and said, oh, I know this feeling. This is the feeling that you get when you're supposed to panic. Mm. Now, when you panic, what do you do? You sell the bottom. So instead of selling the bottom, why not sell a little bit and rebalance your portfolio or what's called swapping delta, right? So like if we're, if we're long spot tokens, we want to sell those and buy options where you can get more benefit on a kind of reflexive bounce. That, I don't know how to, te I definitely can't teach that. That just comes with experience over time and being in those positions, but also being able to master and control your emotional state. It is very hard to do. Like mm -hmm. I still, from time to time, have these kind of euphoric or panic moments. I'm not, I'm a human being. I'm not like some sociopath that has no emotions or can understand this type of stuff. The difference is, is that when you're in a trading mindset, you have to find a way to say, man, we're up an enormous amount of money. Like I'm getting euphoric. I'm looking at buying second homes or a nice car. You know, like there's little things that you're, you start sharing your P and L with I'm people. I'm screenshotting my portfolio. That it, th say. These are like, and they're, 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 it's, it's so <laughs> yeah. classic. Yeah. Right. And the same thing happens at the bottom. Like I kid you not. I had so many people DMing me on telegram signal, Twitter, et cetera. Like, is this the end? Is it like, I'm about to get liquidated. What do I do? Like, I'm like, oh, we're so close. We're so close to the bottom, you know? And so there are other aspects like that that I think will start to inform your view when you can also recognize like the feeling in your stomach uh, and act on it in kind of like the opposite way that you, your body is telling you how to react. So as you said, right, your, your guts is your second brain. So you need to kind of split both brains, the first brain, the second brain, and use the first brain to rationally have a look at the second brain, which obviously is way easier said than done. That like, is correct. And this is one of the reasons why there's been such a rise in, you know, computer algorithmic driven trading because there's, they're machines, there's no emotions, right? You put emotions into, you know, investing and trading and you end up with these kind of euphoric and catastrophic depressive states, which are opportunities for the people that kind of do the inverse. The next secret, you kind of mentioned it already before, but I want to go a bit deeper is you need to intimately understand the concept of loss aversion. What is loss aversion and why is it so important to understand for anyone who wants to become a great crypto investor? Yeah, so we have this, you know, emotional construct of human beings called loss aversion, which I kind of alluded to earlier, which is we 
hate losing more than we enjoy winning. I don't know why. It's probably some instinctual, you know, fight or flight thing. I'm not sure. Like, um, maybe you're always kind of on the defense because you don't want to get eaten by a lion or something, right? Maybe that's where it goes back to. But nonetheless, pretty much every human being has this innate feeling or emotional construct. When you apply, when you have skin in the game and you apply your own money to something as an investment, you as a human are immediately emotionally tied to that and its value. And you can see the value of it in real time, especially with crypto, right? Because it goes up and down every second. Um, The challenge that I think people run into with loss aversion is somewhat what I alluded to earlier is that before you put a trade on, let's just talk about like liquid token investing or liquid asset investing. You should know your exit before you put it on. Meaning that's actually the last, the last uh, secret. Yeah, there you go. So the reason you should know that is that if you don't, here's what happens. And I am almost certain many of you watching this and listening, this is, this has been your scenario. Okay. I'm going to buy, you know, Bitcoin at $65,000, okay? And I'm going all in. I'm putting all my money into it, which is a bad idea. But let's just assume that you guys do that. Uh, so it's 65,000. Oh, it goes down to 64. You're like, oh, it's just, a, you know, whatever. It's nothing, right? And then it's like at 60K. And you're like, well, it's down 8%. It's not the end of the world, you know? Bitcoin's a highly volatile asset. It'll bounce back. Now it's at 50K. And you go... Ah, well, you know, that's a big psychological level. We're going to bounce from there. Now it's at 48K. Uh, You're like, hmm, it broke that level. But you know what? I'm holding this for the long term. I'm a long term investor. You put a trade on, (laughs) not a long term investment. Now, if it was a long term investment, these prices are irrelevant to you, right? Mm -hmm. You're just holding it, right? Like, but if you're watching the price, it's a trade. And so what people end up doing is they justify why they stay in a losing position. It's so easy to do. Like we're human beings. This is what we do. And we find ways of rationalizing. Oh, well, you know, uh, there's this supply overhang from a token. Stop. Like the price is the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters. And if it's going against you, you are wrong. I tell people all the time, there's nothing wrong with being wrong. Staying wrong is a sin. And that's one of the things that I had to learn the hard way as well as a trader and investor. I am wrong all the time. But when I'm right, I'm really fucking right. And that works in my favor because if you can clip things away that you're wrong at, it's signal. You're tuning in and you're also recognizing that you're not falling victim to loss aversion, which leads to the the last piece, which is if you do have an exit strategy on a trade, not an investment, on a trade, there's no emotion associated with it. Let's say you buy Bitcoin at 65K and you're like, I'm going to risk, you know, 10%. So if it goes down 6,500 bucks, I immediately sell it. Don't even think about it. I want it. I want to sell it if it goes up 20%, right? Just picking a number. So that would be $13,000 above 65,000, $78,000. If Bitcoin gets to 78,000, I'm selling it. Now, what ends up happening? People see it go down 10%. And they don't sell it. They're like, oh, it'll bounce back. Of course. Because their emotions get involved. <laughs> or conversely, it's at 78,000. You're like, no, I think it's going to keep going. We look at all the momentum behind it. We just broke out. The institutions are coming. It's Q4. It's a Santa Claus rally. Let's find every possible reason to justify why this thing's going higher. And then guess what happens? <laughs> it falls and reverses in your face every <laughs> single time. Right? And so. Except the time that you actually sold. <laughs> Exactly. And that is absolutely the lesson. There is this, you know, my, my trading partner, like I said, I've mentioned him a handful of times, like we've got about 50 years of trading experience between the two of us. And there is a concept called paying the gods in trading, paying the gods. And there are trader, there are two types of traders, those that know paying the God that you should pay the gods and those that do not. Hmm. And the ones that know that you got to pay the gods, sometimes when the market pulls back, you're like, all right, here's a few shekels, you know, do your thing. This is a completely made up, you know, superstitious concept. The same exists when you go up. You're like, you know what? We just made a little bit of profit. Like, let's uh, throw a little bit in the, uh, the, the, the coffers of the trading gods, so to speak. And it's more of like staying in rhythm with the market as opposed to being some fictiony, fictionary, like, or excuse me, fictional godlike deity that's actually controlling the market. But there is something to be said about like being in tune with, Oh man, we're really ripping. We should probably pay the gods. Pay, no, take a few chips off the table. 
If it pulls back, cool. But if it keeps going, we'll still, we'll still got some on or whatever that thing might actually be, right? And so having like this strategy in place and knowing when to like, you know, uh, take a loss on something, take profits on something, pay the gods in the meantime, it just, there's there's no way of learning this mm. out of a book or a movie or, or a podcast. Like you just have to do it. Probably as a um, sort of summary, I'm just thinking about the few conversations I had with some people who are learning, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we're kind of all learning to become better investors or traders. It always feels like shit. <laughs> it, always, if it always feels like shit. Yeah. It's probably good, right? Mm -hmm. I need to buy when I feel bad, but I need to sell when I feel good. It always feels like shit. I'm never going to feel good. Yep. At least not in that moment. In the future, I'll be like, probably the price is going to go lower at some point. So oh, I made the right decision, but maybe I made the right decision now in six months, right? Because it's going to go much higher and then go lower, right? It always feels like shit. Yep. That's right. That's it. And so there, that's why it's so hard. Exactly. And that is why there are so few good traders. Absolutely. Because yeah. who wants to work a job <laughs> where you're supposed to do something when you feel like shit like buy, and then when you feel great, you're supposed to end it. Yeah. Like who, who wants, wants to, to feel end shit all, feeling great? Who wants no. to feel like shit all the time? Yes, man. and who wants to feel shitty <laughs> a lot of the time, right? It is, uh, again, it's like there is there are um, there's emotions that are involved with trading that most people just can't seem to overcome for very justifiable reasons. And I think that when you, when you kind of you've like adapt, I mean, it's really just, you just have to go through the pain of this for so long that you just get calcified by it. I mean, seriously. And then also you develop like, <laughs> I would say mental and intestinal fortitude such that you can identify trading opportunities and execute on them. And also like, I mean, dude, I've lost tons of money before. Like, of course, like mm. that's part of trading, mm. right? Like if you're running a business at some point in your business, you're going to take losses. It is inevitable, right? Maybe you have an advertiser pull out last minute and you're like, shit, I thought I was going to have this revenue stream. It's gone. That's technically a loss. The same thing happens in trading, right? But if you can be, if you can minimize those losses and also learn from them and kind of continue to tack in on like how to optimize your way of trading and investing over the long term, you should do okay. It's just that most people can't stomach the pain. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're an entrepreneur, so you're by definition extremely optimistic, but you're also skeptical. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important to be skeptical about pretty much everything? Yeah, um, man, where do I start with this one? <clears throat> Maybe I can guide you and we can start talking about some specific examples in your life, right? For example, the medical system. Yes. So, um, Look, I think I kind of alluded to this at the beginning of the, the episode where um, growing up with my brothers and, you know, in a single parent environment, you know, our mother enabled us to really explore other aspects of life as, you know, kids, adolescents, et cetera. And we could pursue things in a way with a level of license that I don't think a lot of kids get. That was what she could provide to us, which was fantastic. And in doing so, <clears throat> you know, we, I think me and all three of my brothers would agree, we have a pretty healthy uh, dose of questioning authority in general. And it doesn't mean you have to question authority as like a rebellious teenager. It just means maybe you should be asking the question why something is a particular way that it is. Like, Price targets. Why do we even have price targets, right? Like, where did this thing come, come from? Why is an authority figure, CNBC or some investment banker, telling me about this? Where, where did it even come from? And why are we even talking about it? Can we just like break this down for a second and look at it and go, actually, this is completely ridiculous? People tend to not do that. And I think that by constantly questioning things, you actually like unpack alpha that you didn't even actually realize was there. Absolutely. Right. That's how you build businesses too, right? Correct. Absolutely. And so, you know, uh, I, I always, I get this question. A lot of people are like, well, what, what's the killer app going to be for crypto? And it's like, no one fucking knows. Like uh, no yeah. one knows, <laughs> but guess what? Like 
you probabilistically try to find founders and spaces and things that are going to be potentially groundbreaking. And like with a little bit of luck, things can happen, right? Like if you look at the artificial intelligence industry, it's been around for doing research for 70 years. Nobody in the 1990s was like, can I have a conversational search chat bot, please? No, no one was saying that because no one knew it existed. And then we had the breakout out of app of ChatGPT. And so as it gets to like, you know, being skeptical of things or, or questioning things, I think what you'll find is that by having like a healthy dose of skepticism, um, can inform your view in a way where you can identify opportunities where other people are not. Because when, when folks tend to kind of just follow the herd, I mean, we were talking earlier about people tend to like, a lot of people tend to like to be just directed. There's like a lot of opportunity that is being missed. I'll give you like a completely ridiculously tried example. So if you've ever been in New York City, I used to live in New York, you can go to like in the subway, people will get off the train and there'll be like, you know, an L shape of like turnstiles to get out. Mm -hmm. And what you'll see is, all of these people flowing into like <laughs> one thing. I right? think about that every time I get out of the tube in London. Exactly. Exactly. I'm like, what? There's another there, one. There's, there's, there's like out. three open ones right yes. here. <laughs> and all of these people are just like herding cattle, like going through it. And this is a completely ridiculous example, but it underscores the point. <laughs> like, wait a second. Why aren't people just looking right there to go out? Because they're not thinking like- It's not written way out to this it, one. <laughs> yeah, it, like they, they're just like, they're just going through life yeah. in a way. And it, again, it's not a judgment. It's just yeah. an example to, to showcase that like, if you don't actually question things or think like, why are we doing this? You won't find very obvious solutions. In the metro, the escalator one is a good one too. When you have two escalators and one is empty, but moving and the other is full, everybody goes to the full one. You're like- Makes no sense. I'll probably go have a look at the other one. And worst case, what, I just come back, right? But Yes, like, exactly. Yes. You said the system, uh, the medical system is designed to keep you sick instead of healing you. So that's one of the areas where you actually questioned a lot and discovered or realized that yeah, I mean, the look, masses like, are not doing the right thing, right? Yeah, look, uh, <laughs> uh, as someone who grew up with humble beginnings, we did not have health insurance all mm -hmm. the time, right? And in fact, when I was in college, I blew up my ACL playing basketball, not at college. I'm, I'm too short, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, just playing basketball one day, I was like 21 years old, blew out my ACL and did have health insurance. And I went to this doctor and said to him, you know, like, what's the deal? Like, what do I got to do? He's like, well, you need to have re uh, reconstructive arthroscopic knee surgery where you take a chunk of your patella out, and anchor it with two screws. And I was like, cool. Like, uh, how much does that cost? And he's like, well, you know, your insurance will cover it. It's probably like $10,000. And I was like, well, I don't have insurance. And he's like, oh, and he's like, well, what can you pay? And I said, $900. And he said, we'll take it. And it, at the age of like 20 or 21 years old, wow. I, it, it, it dramatically changed my perspective on the healthcare system in the United States. <laughs> Think about what just happened. I got a 91% discount <laughs> by not having insurance. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> How the fuck does that work? <laughs> you know why? Because the system is captured by insurance, big pharma, the medical providers to the extent where they're, they can drive up certain costs that fit their particular models and then also force people to have insurance. Or if you don't, you're like terrified what will happen. Yeah. You're like, well, you can negotiate. That's, right? so, contra that's so interesting. <laughs> um, now we can take this one step further. Um, so this was, you know, years ago. This is a long time ago. Uh, today, the medical industry, and again, I'm just speaking from the U.S. perspective, like, um, there are treatments that can actually fix you where you don't have to keep coming back to the hospital. Um, for example, I, I blew out my knee, had ACL surgery, I had chronic knee pain for 20 plus years. Um, last year I had stem cells, uh, injected into my knee and the pain is literally gone. I've never had pain again in my knee that I had pain for 20 plus years. 12 years ago, I had reconstructive ACL surgery in my shoulder, or excuse me, um, rotator cuff surgery, chronic pain. Couldn't even like lift my arm all the way up because of how kind of tight the reattachment was in the surgery. Stem cells and PRP, zero pain. Can do full load bearing exercises, pull ups, hang, everything. Completely gone. Um, last summer, I tore my left pec working out, did five rounds of PRP, no surgery needed, fixed, completely, completely sorted. 
there's a concept, uh, this thing called hydrodissection where, you know, I know some people have this experience where like right on the tip of your elbow, there's like a nerve. And sometimes if you just touch it right, when you're getting out of like a chair or bed, it will shoot a bunch of pain through your body. Turns out that you can inject dextrose, which is a form of sugar into the nerve and it calms down instantly. Pain is gone. Why are these not covered by insurance? Because they fix you, mm. right? Why is it that uh, the food industry in the United States has chemicals and is so highly processed to the extent that other developed countries in the world have banned the chemicals used in the U.S. food system. Well, um, if people, if we can maximize, you know, the kind of, uh, call it, I don't want to list any names of companies, but these large organizations, large companies that are mass producing food and can strip as many nutrients out of them and maximize profitability. It also serves the pharmaceutical and the medical industry because all these people are now sick. Because if you're consuming things like seed oils or, you know, a lot of uh, hydrogenated, you know, uh, oils, or if you're eating chemicals, literally like red number five and all these types of things that are pretty much not found in nature have to be heavily processed and then um, packaged into food. That actually makes you sick. And so why is it that we're not focusing as a country uh, or as a, you know, industry on things like stem cell, PRP, hydrodissection, prolotherapy, et cetera, as well as, I don't know, fundamentally changing people's diet and food? Well, it's very simple. Look at the incentives. What is the incentive of a food company in making wholesome food. It's too expensive. What is the point of a pharmaceutical in, uh, company creating a pill that you only take once, right? It's like me, I have to shave my head, right? I have to buy razor blades. That is a great business model. I am Absolutely. forever going to have to buy razor blades unless I want to look like a total prick with a horseshoe for hair. I don't want that to happen to me, right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to buy razor blades for the rest of my life. Pharmaceuticals, same sort of business model. And the, and the, the kind of healthcare industry itself is the same type of setup. I you know, I'm a huge proponent for things like stem cell PRP. And it, it's not just for like acute, uh, injuries. It can also treat things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, same with like, a uh, um, you know, reducing your inflammation in your diet. All these things can be net beneficial to folks that have neurological diseases yet they're not covered by insurance. So if you're questioning authority and you're looking at it from a healthy dose of skepticism, what you find is there's alpha in doing things like stem cells and PRP, and you can also know that the system is captured from a regulatory standpoint by big pharma and healthcare providers, and it's likely not going to change for quite some time. I always end up this conversation with the same question to every guest. So I'm going to ask you the same question as I ask everyone else. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? <laughs> My biggest prediction for the next 12 months. <sighs> um... I think in the next 12 months, um, there will be a pretty strong resurgence of American exceptionalism, which sounds incredibly biased as an American citizen. I just look at the, the forecast of how the United States has positioned itself uh, in the arms race for things like, you know, chip manufacturing, um, on, like re-onshoring, reshoring manufacturing, uh, the strength of, uh, you know, the U S treasury and the federal reserve, how they work in concert. It just feels like to me, they've got a monopoly on the system still. And if you look at the power players that were involved in the kind of the last call it 10, 15 years, China and Russia, they have been largely kneecapped by an administration's set of policies that um, whether you like Biden or not, like it's worked. Um, you basically have China with very little domestic demand. You have Russia. Yes, they are, you know, there's still an armed conflict in Ukraine. I'm not a supporter of any of that kind of stuff, but ultimately clipping them from the banking system and disabling access to things that are going to help them upgrade their energy infrastructure. It just feels like America, uh, the United States has an upper hand once again on like the geopolitical scale. So I would argue in the next 12 months, you probably see the United States continuing to kind of outperform, if you will, every other geo on the planet. So in a nutshell, bullish the U.S., How can I not be? <laughs> Thank you so much, Joe, for doing that. It was a really amazing conversation. My pleasure. It was great to be here.